the best way to learn a language, immersion, living where the language is spoken and using it every day. But if that's not in the cards for you this year, you can still learn a language the second best way, and that's with Babbel. Be a better you in 2024 with Babbel, the science-backed language learning app that actually works. Don't pay hundreds of dollars for private tutors or waste hours on apps that don't really help you speak the language. Babbel's quick 10-minute lessons are handcrafted by over 200 language experts to help you start speaking a new language in as little as three weeks. Babbel's designed by real people for real conversations. Babbel's tips and tools are approachable, accessible, rooted in real-life situations, and delivered with conversation-based teaching so you're ready to practice what you've learned in the real world. For instance, I've been using Babbel's convenient courses to help me learn basic conversational skills in German while I'm getting ready for a little trip I'm planning. It's not a language I'd ever studied before, but I find the lessons really easy and kind of like hand-holding me through learning a completely new language to me. And it's reassuring to know that with the help of Babbel, I'll be able to greet people, order food, and ask for directions without having to consult language apps. While I'm in Deutschland, I'm still learning. Studies from Yale, Michigan State University, and others continue to prove Babbel is better. One study found that using Babbel for 15 hours is equivalent to a full semester at college. Babbel has over 16 million subscriptions sold. Plus, all of Babbel's 14 award-winning language courses are backed by their 20-day money-back guarantee. Here's a special limited-time deal for our listeners. Right now, get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners, at babbel.com slash vulgar. Get up to 60% off at babbel.com slash vulgar, spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash vulgar. Rules and restrictions may apply. Hi, this is Rob Benedict. And I am Richard Spate. We were both on a little show you might know called Supernatural. It had a pretty good run. 15 seasons, 327 episodes. And though we have seen, of course, every episode many times, we figured, hey, now that we're wrapped, let's watch it all again. And we can't do that alone. So we're inviting the cast and crew that made the show along for the ride. We've got writers, producers, composers, directors, and we'll of course have some actors on as well, including some certain guys that played some certain pretty iconic brothers. It was kind of a little bit of a left field choice in the best way possible. The note from Kripke was, he's great, we love him, but we're looking for like a really intelligent Duchovny type. With 15 seasons to explore, it's going to be the road trip of several lifetimes. So please join us and subscribe to Supernatural then and now. And welcome to Vulgar History. My name is Anne Foster, and this is a feminist women's history comedy podcast. This is season two, and what we've been looking at all season long are women leaders in history and the men who whined about them. And this was going to be the season two finale. We've been sort of going in chronological order, and this is as close to modern day as we were going to get. But then I found another story that I really wanted to do. So there's going to be one more episode next week. So this is the penultimate episode of season two, which is not to say the penultimate episode of this podcast forever is just of season two. And if you go through the um, feed, if you're listening to this in real time, um, I'm recording this during the pandemic era and I've been releasing some uh, mini shows for everybody just about some interesting stories about past pandemics and world histories and some of the bonkers things that happened that people did during them. So anyway, so what I was doing was I was researching different pandemic stuff and then I found the story that was really cool. And when I started to sort of write the context for it, I realized like, oh, this is this is a full episode. This isn't just a pandemic mini-sode, all of which to say, this is a regular episode this week. There'll be another regular episode next week and in between all kinds of pandemic specials because I keep reading about it for some reason, how other people dealt with pandemic type situations. Anyway, I'm pretty sure today's episode doesn't have any plague in it. Although I think there is, there's smallpox, smallpox is involved. People die of various things because human bodies do that. But anyway, so we've been looking at women leaders in history. Most of them 
many of them from um, England and or the United Kingdom as well. You know, we also had a, a sojourn into ancient Egypt and ancient Rome. But the woman who I'm going to look at this week is one of, I think, ooh, am I right? One of only four officially recognized queen regnants of, of England slash the United Kingdom. Pretty sure there's only four. Um, and it is Queen Anne of Great Britain. And she suddenly became very well known after she was the subject of the film The Favorite in 2018 that won the Oscars in 2019. And her story is really, really interesting. And I'm glad that The Favorite came out and that a lot of people saw it and it got a lot of people Googling who is Queen Anne because that did really good things for the search engine optimization on my blog. Um, Anyway, but mostly, more than anything, I'm just glad that it's got people looking at her and reassessing her and figuring out who she is. So when I went to see The Favourite for the first time, because I've seen it more than once, obviously, because it's an amazing movie, I, afterwards, there were some people in the audience, and it was two, I think it was two young men, it was at least a young man and companion, and one of them was just like, who, like, he had clearly just googled who is Queen Anne, and he was reading some stuff about like, oh yeah, and like, he was reading stuff about Anne Boleyn, basically, and I was just like, Ooh, should I correct him? Ooh, this is awkward. And then um, I couldn't stop myself. I had to say like, oh, no, 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 it's this, this, it's not the same as Anne Boleyn. This is a whole different time period. So bold, bold of Yorgos Lanthimos, the filmmaker, to make a film about a woman that not a lot of people knew who she was to begin with. And clearly a lot of people went to see the movie and still didn't know who she was because I still get a lot of hits on my on my website for who is she. So we're going to talk about it because it is an incredibly interesting story with lots of twists, turns, um, and the whole thing about like women and leadership. A lot of the themes we've looked at at other people this season all come into play again. So let's do it. So Anne, with an E, I have to say, my name is Anne Foster without an E. Her name is Anne with an E. It's a little strange for me to be talking about Anne in the third person, but here we go. Anne, not me, was born on February 6th, 1665, and she was the fourth child born to then the king. So the king at the time was King Charles II. She was born to King Charles II's younger brother, Prince James, and his wife, Anne Hyde. So King Charles II was very well known for having lots of mistresses and lots of children with his mistresses, but no legitimate children. This meant that Princess Princess Anne, our main character, her father, the younger brother of the king, was heir to the throne because the whole thing was it goes from father to son, from man to man. Uh, And in this case, there wasn't even any women options. Like it was just going to go to him. So her father was heir to the throne, meaning that her older brother who is named James. Her father was also named James. This is going to get confusing, like these stories always do. So I'll try and explain who they are in context. So heir to the throne was Anne's father, James. And then next in line to the throne was Anne's older brother, also called James. And then next in line to the throne was Anne's older sister, called Mary, and then her. So this is already looking like a pretty unlikely scenario that she's going to end up becoming the monarch at all, right? Lots of people ahead of her who could have their own children, etc. Oh ho, that's, we all know what's going to happen. Well, you know where it's going to wind up, but you don't know what's going to happen because how could you? It is a wild story. So Prince James, her father, was widely rumored to be a secret Catholic. And this was an era, 1665, when the country's religion was Protestant. So Charles II, the king, instructed that Anne and all of her siblings should be raised as Protestants, just in case they wound up taking over the country in the future, so that there would continue to be Protestant monarchs. So the first six years of Anne's life were marked by a lot of death. And I mean, just from what I've been reading about recently, she was born February 1665. That was just around the time that the Great Plague hit London slash England. So there was a lot of death of people she didn't know, as well as people she did know. So her brother, James, her older brother, died when Anne was two years old. And at around the same time, her parents had another son, a new baby brother called Charles, who died in infancy at around the same time. Um, She also had a baby sister named Henrietta, 
one year later, who was born and then died in infancy. And by this point, and again, we're just this is just the first six years of her life, Anne herself was already dealing with a medical condition of some sort. And it's the sort of thing, even nowadays, people might not know what it is. You know, when the symptoms are just like, we're not sure, that's kind of not the symptom of anything. So maybe it's all in your head because you're a girl, sort of thing. So she had a lot of medical issues throughout her life. Um, the issue that she had here was that her eyes watered excessively. Okay. Um, so she was shipped off age four to stay in France with her grandmother because they thought that maybe the fresh French air, I don't know, maybe she would recuperate over there. But shortly after she arrived, her grandmother died. So then Anne was transferred to stay with an aunt who is also in France. And then that aunt died. And so six-year-old Anne was shipped back to England. Um, very soon after she returned, two more younger siblings died in infancy, and at around the same time, her mother died. So if you're keeping track, we now just have two royal siblings left. Mary, the older sister, and Anne, the younger sister. Unless their father remarried and had another son, these two girls were second and third in line to the throne. But remember how her father was rumored to be a secret Catholic? He came out of the Catholic closet when Anne was eight years old, publicly converting to being a full Roman Catholic, which was like the biggest scandal ever because the country was Protestant. There had been numerous wars about this. Um, and then her father chose a new wife, because remember his wife had died, who was a Catholic princess named Mary of Modena. Mary of Modena was 14 years old, making her just six years older than her new stepdaughter, Anne. And everyone started to freak out about the sons that James and Mary and Medina would likely start having because the sons would be Catholic and because of primogeniture, they would be ahead of Anne and Mary. And everyone's just panicking because it seems like, what if the next king is going to be Catholic? So in 1677, Anne's older sister, Mary, was married to their Protestant cousin, William III of Orange, which is in the Netherlands. So Mary, the older sister, sailed away to live with him in the Netherlands to be queen over there. Um, Anne was infected with smallpox at around the same time of, as her sister's wedding, so she couldn't attend and she wasn't able to say goodbye, which is just pretty sad. Um, also having smallpox is a horrible thing. I was reading about that for some of these pandemic podcast episodes and just like, it's great that she didn't die of it. So speaking of sad, um, her governess also caught smallpox and died. So Anne's bad luck of being constantly surrounded by death and her being the only one who doesn't die continued on. Um, when she was 12 years old, her uncle, King Charles II, chose a husband for her. So she got married to her cousin, Prince George of Denmark, on July 28, 1683, which meant Anne got to move out of the family palace and start her own royal court age 12. Um, she also got her own ladies in waiting and one of them was a childhood friend of hers, a young girl who she'd grown up with whose name was Sarah Churchill. Um, remember that name because that's going to come up lots more later. Uh, despite her young age, Anne's marriage to George was consummated pretty quickly um, as she became pregnant really soon. Um, her first pregnancy ended in a stillbirth, but she became pregnant twice more in the next two years. And she had two daughters whose names were Mary, because this story doesn't have enough people named Mary in it yet, apparently, and Anne, Anne Sophia, which is a nice name. And soon after that, her uncle King Charles II died, meaning that her father um, became King James II, um, a Catholic king. And this meant a whole bunch of new problems for basically everybody so from basically day one nobody was a fan of king james ii especially the way that he fired all the protestant officials and hired new catholic people in their place anne who remember had been raised protestant because remember her uncle the king had made sure that she was raised protestant um continued to practice her own faith as did her sister off in the netherlands with her husband william uh, James II was like, so it would be really cool, Anne, if you had your daughters baptized as Catholics. Um, apparently this made Anne burst into tears, hated um, Catholics. She didn't want her daughters to be Catholic. Like, she was so upset that from this point on, after he suggested that, she became estranged from her father and her stepmother, Mary of Medina, who was again six years older than her. Um, but... Anne didn't have a lot of time to focus on family estrangement because her life continued to be unrelentingly tinged with death and tragedy. 
over a period of one week in 1687, she had another miscarriage. Both of her young daughters died of smallpox, and her husband George also fell ill, presumably smallpox also. Uh, this is a story where anytime someone gets sick from this point on, which I'm just assuming smallpox. So she and George were left grieving the death of their children and the miscarriage as he struggled to survive. Um, but George made a full recovery and Anne became pregnant again later that year, which ended in another stillbirth. Um, but someone else was also not having much luck vis-a-vis -vis pregnancies, her six years older stepmother, Mary of Modena. So Mary of Modena, the stepmother, had become pregnant 10 times since she married Anne's father. Each of these 10 pregnancies had ended in either miscarriage, stillbirth, or the infant death of the child. And this is so sad um, for Mary of Modena as a woman, as a person, just to go through this. Anne was also freaking James out because he needed to have a new Catholic heir, otherwise his Protestant daughters would become his heirs. And this was an issue of like, oh no, women heirs, but also like the religion thing. So as long as he and Mary of Modena didn't have a surviving child, then Mary and then Anne would be the next monarchs. But then Mary of Modena suddenly became pregnant and everybody waited to see how it was going to turn out. If it was a son and he survived, he would be the new Catholic heir to the throne, which would change everything. Um, how lucky and convenient that would be. Um, but Anne thought this is all just like a little bit too convenient, maybe. So... Anne had a theory that her stepmother wasn't really pregnant, but was actually faking being pregnant. And the plan that Anne thought her stepmother had was that on the delivery day, she'd pull a switcheroo with some random baby and claim that was the new Catholic heir to the throne. Um, why would they maybe do this? Well, basically because Mary of Medina and James were really desperate to have a surviving son and heir to continue on their Catholic ways, and they really didn't want Anne or Mary to become the new queen and switch everybody back to being Protestant. And Anne didn't keep her theory a secret. She made sure that everybody heard this rumor because, as we will see in later examples, she lived for the drama of it all. So a bit before her stepmother's delivery date, Anne had another miscarriage, or she said she did, or she did and used it to her advantage. Anyway, she went off to recuperate in the spa town of Bath. So normally, when the new queen gives birth to a new heir, the other heirs come into the room to witness the birth to make in case somebody dies and the other heirs have to like quickly take over because childbirth was so dangerous at this period. But Anne was like, sorry, I can't be there to watch this probably fake birth. I'm too busy here at the spa um, because I just had a miscarriage. Bye. Um, so it was kind of convenient. And so this is where the rumors come from that she had maybe was lying about the miscarriage in order to just have an excuse to not be present for the birth. Um, so while Anne was in Bath, her stepmother allegedly gave birth to a son or else pulled a switcheroo or one way or another, there was a new heir to the throne who was a baby named James, who was baptized Catholic. Um, every male person in the story seems to be called James, but this one is little baby James. So Anne wrote a letter to her sister Mary in the Netherlands, and she was in the letter. She was like, so allegedly, this baby James is her half-brother, but I don't know if he really is. There might have been a switcheroo involved. Um, I wasn't there at the birth because I was tragically at the spa that day. Um, so please feel free to spread this rumor around the Netherlands. And her sister wrote back, like, solid theory. Um, also, P.S. William and I are probably going to invade and take over from our Catholic father. Don't tell anyone. And Anne was like, amazing, I'll keep her father distracted with all this fake baby stuff so he'll be too busy to notice you and William invading. And that is exactly what happened. So their father, King James II, was really busy defending himself, being like, my wife just 100% gave birth to, to a baby. I can prove it. Look here, there's 40 other people were in the room when she gave birth and I'll get them all to testify. And they'll all say that they saw the baby come out of her vagina. Like, Anne, can you please come and hear their testimony so you'll stop spreading these rumors? And Anne was like, I'm sorry, I can't travel. I'm pregnant. Um, which for most of her life would have been true, but at this point was not. She was totally lying. Um, so her father had a written record of all the 40 witnesses testimony. And he was like, Anne, I can send you the minutes of this testimony so you can read it to stop spreading these rumors. And she was like, mm, no, thanks. And James um, freaked out and Anne just kind of kept him distracted with that. And then revolution. So 
As her sister had hinted, um, she and William of Orange invaded England on November 5th, 1688, in order to take over as Protestant co-monarchs. And it worked. They were successful, and the whole thing became known as the Glorious Revolution. So now, um, back in England, Anne had been pretending like she didn't know this was going to happen. And in fact, the only person that she told was her best friend forever, her BFF, Sarah Churchill, Duchess of Marlborough. Remember her from earlier? Um, her lady-in-waiting? So, Sarah Churchill was connected to the very powerful Churchill family, who are, side note, the ancestors of Winston Churchill. Um, and so the powerful Churchill family supported William and Mary's coup, but then James found out that the Churchills were against him, and he ordered that Sarah should be arrested. And Anne freaked out. She was like, I will never betray my best friend. And she secretly snuck out the backstairs of the palace with Sarah to escape being arrested. When James found out that his daughter had deserted him, he was like, wow, like not even my estranged daughter supports me. I guess I'll just go flee to France with my wife and baby James. And that is what they did. So after all this happened, um, the courtiers, like all the people in the palace were like, whoa, that was like super intense. Like, Anne, are you OK? And she was like, mm, it's fine. Um, what day is it? Tuesday? Oh, Tuesday. That's the day I play cards. Let's play cards. And everybody was like, whoa, look how chill she is amid all this drama. And she literally played cards but like look at her life to this point she was like like a first responder type person like she's somebody who's like so constantly living through extremely stressful dramatic things her tolerance for highly stressful situations was clearly much higher than that of the average person and so she played cards and william and mary were protestant co-monarchs of england and everything was glorious for like five minutes so since William and Mary didn't have any of their own children, a whole decision had to be made about who would be their heir as co-monarchs, whichever one of them died first would be succeeded by the other one. So sort of like if you listen to the podcast from two weeks ago, the whole Isabella Ferdinand scenario. So, so it's like William's heir is Mary and Mary's heir is William, but once they're both dead, who would it go to? Um, and so the next heir would be Anne or her children, if she had any children. At this point, she did not. Um... But then the year after the Glorious Revolution, Anne had another child. She had a son who named William. Um, he not only survived childbirth and infancy, but like kept growing up. So he was now the heir to William and Mary, baby William. So William and Mary were so grateful to Sarah and the Churchill family for having supported them during the whole revolution that they gave her husband the title Earl of Marlborough. And this is how Sarah herself becomes the Duchess of Marlborough. And then again, everything's great for five minutes and then becomes chaos again, because that is like what this whole woman's life is like. So everything's amazing. So Anne was like, my sister is the queen. She's a Protestant like me, William and Mary. I would like to have a palace I can live in and also lots of allowance money. Thank you. And William and Mary were like, mm, we'll give you a palace, but we're not going to give you any allowance money. And Anne was like, OK, but can you give my husband George an important military role? And Mary and William were like, no. And then Anne was like, OK, well, now we're estranged forever. The only friend I need in my life is Sarah Churchill. Goodbye forever. So she just like when someone burned a bridge with Anne, she was just like done with them. It's clearly a character trait. So the only friend she had or that she felt she needed was Sarah Churchill. So they were really, really, really close in a way that princesses and duchesses weren't usually and in a way that they kind of weren't supposed to be based on like cultural expectations, etc. In the film The Favourite, they showed them as being in a sexual relationship. Maybe they were. Um, who knows? But they were definitely really, really close. Anne saw the two of them as equals. And as such, they called each other by the nicknames Mrs. Morley and Mrs. Freeman to indicate how they were on the same level, like class base system wise. But then William and Mary began to suspect that Sarah's husband was secretly meeting with supporters of the deposed King James in France. And this was treason. So they fired the Earl of Marlborough from his various important jobs and demanded that Anne remove Sarah as one of her ladies in waiting. But like clearly at this point, like Anne was never going to betray her best friend. Um, so it all got super intense to the point that Mary personally fired Sarah herself, which was like really not really done because Sarah was technically a lady in waiting for Anne. And then Anne just like went full on nuclear option. So Anne stormed into the castle and ran off to live in a different castle because she couldn't even stand to look at her sister anymore after this betrayal. Um, 
And Mary then she fired Anne's guard of honor and officially forbid anyone from talking to her. Like none of the servants could talk to her. Like no one would talk to her. Um, so Anne was in this other palace surrounded by people who weren't even allowed to acknowledge that she was there. So this like sisterly drama playing out in this like 17th century royal setting. It's just wild. I want to have like a, a prequel like mini series to the favorite about young Anne and Mary because this is just like my god. Okay. Um, so as ever, I mean, Anne was pregnant through all of this. Like, just assume until her husband dies, she is constantly pregnant because she was. Um, so in the midst of all this drama with her and her sister, she gave birth to another son who only lived for a few minutes, sadly. William was still there, though. She still had one son. So after this latest child death, um, Mary headed off to the other castle. And so you think, like, was she going to go and make amends with her sister? Was she going to, like, help grieve with her over this child death? Um, of course not. What happened is Mary stomped into Anne's room being like, oh, stop being friends with Sarah. I hate you. And then Anne was like, oh, I hate you too. And then she moved to another different castle even further away. And she never saw her sister again because Mary died two years later of smallpox. And these were two women who could hold a grudge. So Mary is now dead, which means William becomes the solo king on his own because he was the co-monarch and kind of her heir. Um... So his heirs at this point were Anne's son, baby William, and Anne was kind of the next heir, I guess, until William had his own other baby William had his own son. So the king, King William, decided to try and smooth over the relationship between him and Anne because basically that's all he had vis-a-vis -vis heirs. So he gave back all the possessions and titles that Mary had previously removed from her. He allowed people to talk to her again and invited her to come back and live in the main palace. He even gave Anne all of Mary's jewels and then restored Sarah and her husband to their former positions. So everything was doing great on one way, but health-wise, Anne was doing not so well. So her 17th, 17th pregnancy ended in a miscarriage at around this time. Um, and all of her other health, various health problems became even worse. Um, so doctors back then had different methodologies and diagnoses than we do now. But um, based on her symptoms, it seems like Anne likely had a pretty bad combination of arthritis, gout, and other things, including the after effects of being pregnant 17 times. Increasingly frequently, she had trouble walking, so she sometimes used a chair with wheels on it because wheelchairs hadn't been invented yet. Um, she sometimes had people carry her around in chairs without wheels on them. So she's living with chronic pain, um, presumably psychological issues based on like literally her whole life so far. And then her son, William, died, aged 11. I'm not sure of what. Um, I'm going to guess smallpox, but some sort of health-based issue. Um, his date of death was July 30th, and Anne decreed that every year on July 30th, everybody in the household that lived with her were to mark that day as a day of mourning. And what this meant with his death was that Anne is literally the only remaining heir to King William. So Parliament was pretty frantic at this point about the issue of who would be heir after all these childless people, not only because they're like, Ugh, a woman inheriting, like that's, we don't love that idea, um, but also like, what if the next person in line was Catholic or something? Like if Anne inherited, like it's not their top choice, but also like she didn't have any surviving children, so who would inherit after her? So it's like a two-pronged, two-stage inheritance crisis. Um, so they unfurled the family tree and crossed off everybody who was Catholic and looked to see who was left. Like 50 names were removed from the line of succession, which meant that a very distant relation, um, who was a Protestant woman named Sophia, Elector of Hanover, went from 51st in line to first in line. Who is Sophia, Elector of Hanover? I'm glad you asked. She was the granddaughter of James I, who was Mary, Queen of Scots' son. So James I had a daughter named, who was Elizabeth of Bohemia, and then Sophia was a descendant of her. Um, so she was the great-granddaughter of Mary, Queen of Scots, and the great-great-great-great-great-granddaughter of Henry VIII's older sister, Margaret Tudor. But what mattered most to everybody, like, and she's a woman, and they're like, as long as she's Protestant, even being a woman is okay. And so an act was written up saying that she was the next heir after Anne, and then her Protestant descendants after her. But first things first. So William died in 1702, which may mean, meant that Queen Anne 
Anne became Queen Anne. She was at this point 37 years old and doing poorly health-wise to the extent that she had to be carried down the aisle of Westminster Abbey in a chair as she couldn't walk for her coronation. But to make it all dramatic, someone, probably Sarah Churchill, um, arranged for a low back to be put on the chair so Anne's long train could unfurl dramatically behind her down the aisle, which sounds amazing. Among her first acts as queen was to give a bunch of important titles to her husband, George, as well as to Sarah and to Sarah's husband. And this is basically where the movie The Favorite begins. So Anne, now the queen, was beyond devoted to her best friend Sarah Churchill to the point that everyone around them was like, um, this is weird. Why is Sarah Churchill so important to this woman? Um, Anne did things like she gave Sarah her own palace and did basically everything nice for her and Sarah was sort of mean to her sometimes and it was seemingly a sort of toxic scenario where Anne sort of like indulged her and the Sarah was sort of mean back to her and again like you can see this all in the favorite the film um and then into this codependent scenario arrived a new courtier named Abigail Hill and this is the role played by Emma Stone in the movie and Anne liked her a lot and they became secret friends because she knew that Sarah didn't want her to be friends with anybody else. Um, Sarah didn't even know that they were friends until Abigail got married to a, ba- a man named Baron Masham, making her now Abigail Baroness Masham, and Anne was a guest at the wedding. So Sarah found out that Anne and Abigail were close enough that Anne got a wedding invitation, and Sarah Churchill freaked out in like rage, jealousy. So there were special rooms at Kensington Palace reserved for Sarah when she came to stay there to visit her friend the queen but since sarah spent most of her time off in her own personal castle Anne let abigail move into sarah's rooms and then sarah freaked out when she found out about that um and then everything just gets wild so sarah showed up at court with a very like raunchy poem all about how the queen was in a sexual relationship with abigail sarah didn't write the poem she had like commissioned it from a poet and so she had this poem that she had written and then she went to the queen like oh my god look someone wrote this poem but you and abigail spending time with her is ruining your reputation so you should stop being friends with her you should be friends with me instead and anne was like can't i have two friends um but secretly anne seemed to enjoy having sarah and abigail fighting over her again the movie the favorite goes through the stuff and a lot of this drama was a very sort of etiquette battle sort of thing like one of sarah's jobs was picking out which jewels the queen would wear each day And one day the queen chose to wear different jewels from the ones Sarah had chosen. And then Sarah freaked out because not wearing the jewels she'd chosen was like the etiquette version of being punched in the face. So Sarah, who clearly had quite a temper that she was not afraid of demonstrating, literally yelled at the queen in public to shut up, which is like, you're not allowed to do that. That's kind of treason. But nobody stopped her and Anne didn't punish her. So it's all just sort of like a, that's, that's the culture that's going on. And so to add to all of this, just like wild sequence of events, um, Anne's husband suddenly died. Again, I'm guessing smallpox. Anne was super upset about this. Obviously, they've been husband for decades. Um, They've been through a lot together as a couple, um, such as 17 pregnancies and all the child death. She'd always had a portrait of her husband, George, hanging in her room. And one day she went into her room and it was gone. And Sarah was like, yeah, that was me. I took down the portrait because I thought it would make you sad and you shouldn't look at it. And then Anne was like, put it back. And Sarah was like, "Mm, make me. And Anne was like, I'm the queen. And Sarah was like, me, me, me. And then they just sort of had this huge fight. And that's the sort of stuff that was going on. Eventually, Anne wrote a letter to Sarah's husband, like, can you please tell your wife to stop being mean to me and stop yelling at me and stop stealing paintings of my dead husband? And Sarah's husband was like, what's going on, Sarah? And so Sarah went to have a face-to-face with Anne, which happened on April 6, 1710. And they had a friend breakup. These two were now officially estranged and say what you will about Queen Anne the first. But when she decided to end a relationship with somebody, she just like, she did. She would no looking back. Um, so meanwhile, back in France, Anne's father, the former king, James, was hanging out with his wife, Mary of Modena, their son, baby James. And they had another child who they named Louisa Maria Teresa. So by now, baby James, who is now an adult, um, had been brought up being told that he was actually the rightful king of England and he believed it. And he kind of was the rightful king of England because William and Mary sort of like took over. Um, anyway, so James, the younger, formerly baby James, and his supporters 
were called the Jacobites, and they decided to sail over to Scotland and begin the work of taking the country back and making it Catholic. They had some secret allies who he thought would help, but Anne had spies of her own who intercepted James and chased him away. But then Sarah Churchill, a woman who could seriously carry a grudge, was spreading the story that Anne secretly wanted her half-brother James to become the heir instead of Sophia, Elector of Hanover. And just like how it was impossible for her father to prove that his child wasn't secretly switcherooed, Anne found it impossible to convince anyone that this gossip wasn't true. Because when people don't like you, they can't really be convinced that mean rumors about you aren't true. Throughout all of this, like this is all just like personal life stuff, and that's what I tend to be most interested in and what I tend to talk about on the podcast, but bear in mind, Anne was also being the queen. So she sat in more cabinet meetings than any previous English monarch had ever done, and also more than most of the later monarchs did. She was interested in what was going on in Parliament and did lots of important political stuff that other people have written about. I'm just here to tell you the juicy gossip bits, but I'll put some some recommended reading in the show notes for this if you want to read about her uh, political side of her life. Um, even though Anne's health concerns were becoming more and more exacerbated, like she became basically a bedridden invalid. Um, she before like she could walk, but she sometimes needed a wheelchair instead. Now she like couldn't even walk anymore. Um, she would wheel herself in her chair with wheels. Um, or have people carry her into Parliament, where she attended like all nighter meetings to go over important governor government business. Um, and then on July thirtieth, seventeen fourteen which is the anniversary, the 14th anniversary of the death of her son, William, the date that she always had everyone commemorate as a day of mourning. Anne had a stroke that left her unable to speak, and then she passed away on April 1st, 1714, aged 49. Queen Anne was buried in Westminster Abbey, the same place where 12 years before she'd been carried down the aisle in a chair with a low back so that she could have a train. Um, she was laid to rest next to her husband, George, as well as the remains of many of her stillborn in, and infant children, as well as her, her son, William, who died aged 11. Um, and Sophia, elector of Hanover, who had been her heir, actually died just a few months before, which meant that Anne's heir was Sophia's son, who became King George I. And we'll talk about that another time. Oh, he was the one who was the king during Mary Toft, um, giving birth to rabbits scenario if you want to just like match these Jenga pieces up in your mind. But the story doesn't end here because Sarah Churchill was not willing to let go of her grudge, even though Anne was dead. So Sarah lived for 30 more years after Anne had died and later published a memoir that basically trashed Anne as being the simpleton slash idiot and spilled lots of like quote unquote secrets that may or may not have been true. But because everyone knew how close Sarah had been to the queen, her word was taken as truth, and this affected Queen Anne's reputation for centuries to come. Because conveniently, Sarah's description of Anne as this kind of useless and overly emotional woman fell neatly into that patriarchal stereotype of women being unsuited for leadership roles, which may also be why her story was the story was accepted so readily. Um, but um, the third point of the, f- the favorites sort of love triangle... Abigail Masham left royal court after Anne's death and lived out the rest of her life in private. So Sarah Churchill is the only one who's just like clinging onto this whole thing. Um, And although Anne's reign was relatively short, I don't know, it was 12 years, which is shorter than some, longer than others, she was the sitting monarch during a number of hugely important political events, such as England and Scotland uniting into Europe's then largest free trade area. She oversaw numerous successful battles, like she wasn't on the battlefield, but a king wouldn't have been either. Um, Actually, Sarah Churchill's husband, Lord Marlborough, led a lot of these battles, but she was the queen while these battles happened, um, especially a lot of sea battles. She was a noted patron of the arts and literature and was the namesake for the well-known Queen Anne style of architecture and furniture. Um, The timing of her reign coincided with a time of a whole lot of colonization by English people in Eastern North America. So a bunch of places were named after her, including the American city of Annapolis, the Nova Scotian um, Annapolis Royal and Annapolis Valley and Fort Anne, as well as Princess Anne Street in Fredericksburg, Virginia, and Queen Square in Bloomsbury, London. So it's time to go through a scandalous scale for Queen Anne. And this is an interesting one, like in terms of like women leaders and the men who whined about them like there was her reputation suffered a lot and a lot of that was because of how sarah churchill 
whined about it, frankly. Um, and it's interesting, too, because of the whole religious, the whole Catholic versus Protestant thing that she was a woman, which was not a lot of people's first choice, but she was Protestant and that was preferred to a Catholic. Um, same with Sophia of Hanover, frankly. Um, but we're going to go into the scandalous scale here. And the first category is scandaliciousness. And I think Queen Anne gets a 10 for scandaliciousness just because she was super into um, gossip. The whole thing where she like went to the spa on purpose, potentially pretending to have had a miscarriage just so she could like continue to spread rumors about her half brother maybe having been switched at birth. Um, the whole, I mean, the Sarah Churchill screaming at her in front of other people, Sarah Churchill showing up with the like lesbian poems, like just the whole, the court at this time seemed to have been quite scandalous and that was a lot of her you know what i'm gonna give her like an maybe not 10 maybe like an eight an eight for scandalousness because there's like a lot of juicy gossip type stuff going on but in terms of like comparing her to other people that we've done on the show there has there's not like a there's no murder moment you know there's not that one major scandal that really tips everything over but just her life she lived her life in a scandalous sort of way that i respect scheminess um, I'm going to give her a nine for scheminess, I think, because while we don't know a lot of the schemes that she got up to, like the ones that we do know about, like, again, like spreading rumors about her half brother being maybe switched up earth, um, the whole thing with like the fact that she knew that her sister was going to invade and she didn't tell anybody, um, the way that she snuck away in the middle of the night to keep Sarah Churchill from being fired, like her scheminess is good. And then also, because we looked at other people this way in terms of like how they ruled, how they led, like she, they had a lot, she oversaw a lot of successful military campaigns, which is sort of scheminess. Her significance is a tricky one because, well, she for a long time was seen as quite insignificant. Um, she was queen for 12 years. And during those 12 years, a lot of stuff happened that was um, helpful to England, such as the beginnings of Great Britain happening, um, a lot of military victories, a lot of places were named after her. Um, so it's sort of like she was significant in a way, like Annapolis is like a thing a lot of people have heard about, even if people don't know who she was, to the point when the movie The Favourite came out, everybody started Googling who is she and read my essay. Um, I'm going to say 6.5, 6.5 for significance. And the final category is the sexism bonus. And this is interesting to consider because on the one hand, if she had been um, in a situation where women were more respected, um, like she would have just been the heir and her father maybe wouldn't have gotten married. There wouldn't have been the whole Jacobite rebellion and stuff. But it's interesting in a way like that her gender didn't super get in her way. Like she became the heir because there was no one else to be the heir after William and Mary. And then she had, I mean, 17 pregnancies, um, like a lot of health problems, like a lot of, and that was all related to her you know, biology and stuff. If she hadn't been pregnant all those many times, maybe she wouldn't have had the health problems. I don't know. I'm, I mean, I can't give her less than a five for sexism, but honestly, and intriguingly, I don't think that was really one of the big challenges that got in her way. So let me just add this up. We have... 28.5 so where does that land her um next week when i do the finale for the season i'm gonna post kind of all the scores so everybody else can see them because i always find it interesting to see i always say and i mean it very genuinely like i'm not pitting these women against each other to say like who's cooler than the other or who's better than the other but just i'm scoring on four different things and where does everybody fall when you score them in this way but 28.5 puts her in fifth place overall like in terms of scores she is shockingly um 0.5 above cleopatra and so she's just below elizabeth bathory who has a 29 i feel like they sort of have some some similarities there i'll post this whole list next week i think because it is interesting to see where everybody goes but frankly um and maybe it's because this season we've been doing women leaders which inherently means they're i guess more significant but the top three right now so agrippina the younger has 31, Empress Matilda has 30, Juana the first of Castile has 30, and then those are all from this season. Elizabeth Bathory from season one is at 29, and then Queen Anne 
is fifth place at 28.5 with Cleopatra and Lucy Hay tied just below her at 28. Anyway, that is Queen Anne of Great Britain. There are a bunch of books. Okay, sorry. There's not a bunch of books. There's literally like two books. Um, There's a book called Queen Anne, The Politics of Passion by Anne Somerset, which gets into, I think it's a great title, The Politics of Passion, because her her emotional, like her relationships with people were so, t- such a significant part of her. She also had a lot of, as they describe it here in the description of the book, um, personal misfortune, um, just the death that constantly surrounded her, um, just a lot of the health problems she had. So yeah, if she had been, I don't know, so I'm reconsidering, like if she had been a man king with similar problems, like I don't think anyone would be like, oh my God, this poor man, he had 17 pregnancies. Well, I mean, chances are he wouldn't but like people don't look at her husband and saying like oh this poor man his he fathered 17 failed pregnancies so i don't know she's really judged harshly it's not like hmm, it's like she's judged harshly in her time she's judged harshly in retrospect by people who say like "Ooh, you know she was a woman she was emotional she had these like relationships with people she had all these pregnancy health problems in a way that men wouldn't be judged but to the point that it sort of supersedes her, what she actually did as a monarch, which was lots of impressive stuff, seeing England through a pretty rocky time. So there's that book, Queen Anne, The Politics of Passion by Anne Somerset. And there's also a book called um, The Favorite, colon, The Life of Sarah Churchill and the History Behind the Major Motion Picture. So this is about Sarah Churchill slash Anne is another book. Um, and I'll put all the links to that in the show notes. I don't know. Is this... Is it, I don't know. I've, I've never done this before, but I think I'm going to bump up her sexism bonus a little bit because in her time, she didn't face a lot of it, but like afterwards she did. I gave her a seven for sexism and I feel like I'm going to give her an eight for sexism, which yes, is going to increase her score. Now she's at 29.5 because she, I don't know, everybody did. It's not a contest, Um, but the people who are up here are, she faced, a, I don't know. I feel I feel good about that. Just talking it through. So now she's fourth place. Agrippina the Younger, thirty one, Empress Matilda at thirty, Juana the First of Castile at thirty, Queen Anne the First, twenty nine point five, Elizabeth Bathory, twenty nine. These are all women on this list who faced they all faced sexism. Anyway, that's kind of the theme of what we're looking at. Anyway, this is the Vulgar History Podcast. My name is Anne Foster. I'm just gonna run through um the things that I always say at the end, just like little reminders for you. For instance, um, if you want to find some books to read, some, I think they're all historical nonfiction books. Um, The ones that I recommend, the ones that I've been using for researching this podcast and other projects I'm working on are all listed on my bookshop.org page. So if you go to bookshop.org slash lists, slash vulgar history recommends with dashes between vulgar history recommends you can find a list of these books about queen anne as well as other books about other women we've been talking about and other books about just nonfiction books that i recommend bookshop.org is a fantastic site um the money from there goes towards independent bookstores who need so much support right now in this pandemic era um so i'm supporting them in this little way that i can the link to that will be in the show notes as well um we've got my little merch store so if you go to teespring.com slash stores slash vulgar history you can find t-shirts tote bags mugs all different sorts of items that are all celebrating commemorating the women who we've been looking at during this season um i've got one like a an item for each of the different women so if there's somebody who's your fave there's somebody who you want to represent um i just put out the juana of castile stuff which is just a portrait of her and it says like la reina like the queen um it's pretty great the thing about the merch store is that i basically want to buy everything from it for myself but maybe you'll like some of the stuff as well um and again that's at teespring and there'll be an item there when this episode drops um for queen anne as well because she's someone who is very much worth celebrating i think um if you're going to support me slash this podcast um, my patreon is patreon.com slash ann foster writer the original essay that i wrote about queen anne Um, which again, um, because of this film and people seeing it and no one knowing who she was, I had, it did amazing things for my website, this film, just people Googling who is this person and then reading my essay about it. So you can find that essay at annfosterwriter.com. The podcast is also on Instagram and Twitter 
And if you have thoughts or comments or whatever, um, you can email that at vulgarhistorypod at gmail.com. And yes, yeah, so this is there's going to be one more episode in this season of Women Leaders in History and the Men Who Whined About Them. That'll be coming out next Wednesday. In the meantime, um, there's going to be some more catch up on the bonus episodes, the pandemic super specials. And on the Patreon, I've been planning and there's more in the works. Um, I have some Patreon only mini episodes that are called So This Asshole, looking at various men in history, rereading through all the stuff about Queen Anne, I feel like. Her father, James II, would be a suitable subject for so this asshole. So those are just on the Patreon page as well. Um, yeah, so my name is Ann Foster. This is the Vulgar History Podcast. I hope you're all doing well. I hope that these gossipy stories of history are a fun distraction for everybody. And I will talk to you all next time. <laughs>